um, in Sinaloa, for example, if you are, if you've give, been given the green light to go into the cartel, the territory controlled by the cartel, to talk to cartel members, um, and it takes you know weeks, months, sometimes years to get that access. Once we're under their protection, we're under their protection. Like we have their protection to be there, but. You know, then certain things happen. Like uh, we were filming in Sinaloa once, and uh, we we're filming these sicarios, and they had their walkie-talkies, and um, so they're communicating with the whole group, and they know everybody that comes in and out of their territory. And suddenly they started panicking because the Marines had a helicopter were coming that, their way, and the Marines in Mexico are known to shoot first and ask questions after, and they started freaking out, and they basically jumped into the cars and left us and we didn't know what to do should we go after them and they're going to think we're part of right. the group and they can start shooting at us or should we stay behind but we were in an open area in a sort of forested area should we try to hide and then we're going to really look suspicious so it was uh it was crazy what did you do we got in a car and followed them and then <sighs> spent the day with them doing cocaine all day because wow. it wasn't safe for us to leave until the night so they just do cocaine all the time they do a lot of cocaine and funny story, my director of photography, Fred Manu, uh, who was a director of photo photography for Bourdain on Parts Unknown before, and he um, he got we were filming the scene and we driven into the Sierra Madre Mountains and then we had to walk for a mile or two to a place where they felt comfortable um, showing us their guns and they were going to start shooting and they would give us the interview of what why it was the story about the American guns flowing down south and. Um, how they're used in the violence. And he, we're walking there, and suddenly Fred basically turns to us and says, I don't feel good. And he had a massive case of, what is it that you call it, the revenge? The oh, Montezuma's, Montezuma's revenge. revenge. <laughs> massive case. And so we walk to the place. Fred's on the floor. They managed to put, like, some sort of cloth on the floor for him. He's, like, walk. <laughs> on the floor, can barely breathe, is like puking and going to the bathroom and all of it is happening at the same time. And the guy is constantly offering him cocaine and telling him, <laughs> dude. <laughs> this will fix you, this, my friend. You have no idea. <laughs> Do this. I am telling you. Fred did not take the cocaine. But, would the uh, cocaine have helped him, he yeah. thinks? He, he was absolutely sure the cocaine would have helped him. I don't know. What if it said, did? Yeah. What if that's the cure? <laughs> What else was in the cocaine? We don't know. Well, these guys are probably getting pure cocaine. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. I mean, yeah. they, why would they cut it? And they're snorting theirs? it all day long. Oh, my God. And then it wasn't it wasn't actually a very good idea for us to stay with them for so long. It was a learning lesson for all of us because that night we were filming with them in a bunker where they kept a lot of their guns. And, um, and one of them had been snorting cocaine all day and um, basically pulled the trigger on the floor. And the bullet came out just like two inches from Fred's head because he was in the bunker right in oh, that boy. hole. And it, yeah, it could have been really bad. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So don't Coked up with, Sicarios don't spend a lot of time with coked up in sicarios. Mexico. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. And how often are those guys killing people? Oh, very often. They also told us all. So they're not considered assassins per se. They're Sicarios. They're hitmen, right? Because they're not... It's part of what they do for the cartel, amongst many other things, like transporting drugs and guns and all of it. But, um, yeah, a lot of people. And he also told me the story of the pers first person he ever killed, and he was ordered to kill, and it was a friend of his. And he went oh. to his house and knocked on the door, and the guy opens the door, and he shoots him. And the guy is yelling, don't kill me, don't kill me, and shoots him right in the face. Oh, boy. Yeah. Terrible. And that's all what happens when you make drugs illegal, because then the criminals are selling them. Yeah. So that we can consume them. Let's yeah. not forget. Yeah. It's it's dirty. Yeah, it is dirty. It's and I don't you know, I've had conversations with people about this, like what is the solution in America? Because if you legalize drugs, all drugs in America, and sold them, like if pharmaceutical drug companies sold heroin, mm -hmm. cocaine, all that. Mm -hmm. I don't want the pharmaceutical companies involved in that. Right. Like who who sells it if it's not them? Yeah, so either the cartel sells it or they sell it. Or no one can sell it. Well, that's not going to be the mm -hmm. case. Someone's going to sell it. Mm -hmm. And if you make it legal, you're going to have more people doing it. Like, we're not accustomed to things being legal. If you made cocaine legal in this country, a bunch of people would try it that wouldn't ordinarily try it because they wouldn't know who to get it mm -hmm. from. They wouldn't know how to do it. If you could just walk into Walgreens and buy mm -hmm. cocaine, 
I guarantee you we'll have more overdoses, more addicts, more. But what is the solution to that? Is it education? Does that even work? Is it counseling? Is it drug rehabilitation centers everywhere? Is it Ibogaine? Like, what is the, what's the solution to? Yeah, I don't know. But I think looking at the example of Portugal is a good idea. We yeah, but we're not Portugal. It. The problem is, like, what we talked about, like, prison guard unions, yeah. privatized prisons, the, the, the state of the, mil- the, the policing in this country and the mm-hmm. way it's done and the amount of people that are in jail in this country mm-hmm. is so insane. Yeah. Yeah, there's no easy answer, which is why we haven't, no one has tried yeah. to solve this. And then there's this bizarre trend to let people out that have committed violent crimes in this country. It's almost like someone's engineering the ter- deterioration of mm-hmm. the country and, like, in- ensuring civil unrest. Mm-hmm. So they're keeping the people that, for minor crimes that shouldn't be there, like the guy selling weed on the corner. Well, they're not even keeping them anymore. Now. No, I mean, it's like Los Angeles in particular is mm-hmm. just nuts. It's just nuts. They have these district attorneys that are mm-hmm. funded by George Soros, and they put them in, and these people, their their mandate is to let as many people out as possible. And violent crime, whatever it is, no cash bail, they're just letting people out. And they're they're letting people out of prison that are violent prisoners. Mm-hmm. It's and like, what's the idea behind that? <sighs> that the prison system's unjust. That's the narrative. But the end result is people are unsafe Mm -hmm. because you've already created this environment with prisons and with a lifetime of crime. These Mm -hmm. people are – they're habitualized. They're criminals. And then they've committed violent crimes and then you let them right back out on the street. Right. Yeah, it's it's wrong. I don't know enough about it. But I do think that we tend to look at the problem the other way around. Mm -hmm. I think that we tend to look at how to – try to stop the problem when it's already a problem without actually tackling the root causes of sure. what is happening and why it's happening, right? Yeah, we've talked about that many times on this podcast. Like, right. if you wanted to solve the root cause, you would f- clean up in inner, inner cities. That's yeah. what you would do. You'd take these crime-ridden, drug-ridden, gang-infested communities, mm-hmm. and you'd invest in a massive amount of money and resources into fixing and rehabilitating them. Yeah. And the money that we have spent just in the Ukraine war could have mm-hmm. done that many times over in this country Mm -hmm. and they've not lifted a finger to stop it it's almost like there's a formula to ensure control and power and you need a certain amount of crime and violence you need a certain amount of people in prison you need a certain amount of despair in the inner cities to ensure that people don't rise up and figure out the system and realize they've been screwed Mm -hmm. over 